ladies and gentlemen, get your cowboy hats. We got a real historian in the house tonight for our Sunday night interview. John Bosnecker, how are you this evening? I'm doing good, thank you. So currently right now there's a show on Netflix and you actually are a contributing part of this show, uh, The Highwaymen. And so part of this story is the story of Frank Hamer. And honestly, I got to know, because you used to be a police officer, so I'm just going to jump right in. When you were a police officer, were you familiar with Mr. Hamer? And do you, you know, if you were, did that affect, you know, your, your mental persona, your mindset of the type of lawman you wanted to be? I was uh, first aware of Frank Hamer when the movie Bonnie and Clyde came out in 1967. And that was uh, one of the great American films starring Faye Dunaway as uh, Bonnie Parker. And Frank Hamer is the Texas Ranger who tracked down and killed Bonnie and Clyde in 1934. And so the film made Hamer the uh, the villain, and he's captured by the gang. He's humiliated by Bonnie. Eventually, he's released, and then in revenge, he tracks them down and kills them. And so, in 1968, Hamer's widow, Gladys Hamer, was so upset by the depiction of her husband, she hired the top trial lawyer in Texas, a guy named Joe Jamail who anybody in Texas who's of my generation, even younger, knows who Joe Jamail is. He passed away a few years ago. He's a, uh, the top trial lawyer in Texas, a multi-gazillionaire, very, very successful. And he filed a lawsuit against uh, Warren Beatty, who was the producer of the film and the star as Clyde Barrow, and recovered a significant amount of money uh, for various business torts, like using Hamer's name without the family permission. He couldn't sue, he's a very smart lawyer, you can't libel a dead man. So he couldn't, and Hamer had passed away about 10 years before this. So uh, Jamail filed this lawsuit, recovers money for the family, but the widow, uh, well, she was so upset she also sponsored a book called I'm Frank Hamer, which I read, it came out the very next year, 1968. I was 15 years old. I rode my bike to the local library where I grew up in Mill Valley, California. And I got the book and read it over and over again. And then over the years, I thought, as I became more knowledgeable about the history of the old West and wrote numerous books about crime and outlaws of the old West, I kept waiting for someone to write a proper biography of Frank Hamer. And so to answer the second part of your question, uh, I was a police officer for eight years from age 21 to 29. They, they made me a training officer. I trained 17 rookies in a, a year and a half. And I found out later, you're only supposed to have two a year. And I would get car sick from sitting there. I'd have a swollen tongue from biting my tongue because you have to let the rookies mess up. And if they don't, you have to let them do everything. And if you don't let them mess up, they don't learn. And you can't be in there controlling everything, at least not the last third of the training program. So eventually I left police work, became an attorney. I can't say I had any more great patience for practicing law than I did for dealing with rookies, but I've been a lawyer ever since. And then in my spare time, I write these books that I mentioned. So Frank Hamer, was something that I always wanted. One of my friends in Texas, of which all the Texas historians and writers of the Old West are all good friends of mine. And I pestered them all for 20 years. When are you guys gonna do a book about Hamer? And most of the response was, you know, he was sort of a transitional lawman. He started out on horseback in the frontier period, the border period, but then he ended up as a gangbuster during the 1930s. So he's he's driving a car. He's not riding a horse. So he's kind of like, you know, outside our wheelhouse. And that was the reason, the main reason why no proper biography of Frank Hamer was ever written. This book that came out in 1968 was basically a puff piece. It was not a critical biography. My book is a critical biography. It shows the warts and all. 
I think those make for the best kind of stories. Do, does it bother you that Bonnie and Clyde is so romanticized? Does it, it to me, it kind of feels like a, a Joker and Harley Quinn affinity or a Romeo and Juliet. And they weren't very good people. I don't understand why the need to romanticize them. And I think I, I recall vividly <clears throat> when the film came out in 1967, our local newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, ran a full page historical piece about the original Bonnie and Clyde. And I was so excited to read it because I was, to me, a woman outlaw. And this is very romantic, right? And I mentioned to my father and I showed him the article and he said they were a bunch of filling station holdup men. You know, they robbed gas stations. They were not romantic. And that was pretty much the attitude among most Americans until the film came out. So there's a modern myth that Bonnie and Clyde were big folk heroes in the South. And they were, I think, to some extent, uh, probably to a certain element of society. But to most people, they were uh, kind of like a poor man's John Dillinger. John Dillinger was seen as the quintessential Depression era bank robber. He escaped from the Crown Point Jail in uh, Indiana, which was heavily guarded. He carved a fake pistol out of a bar of soap or a piece of wood or something, and he tricked the guards. He was really kind of a master criminal. But on the other hand, Bonnie and Clyde were uh, kind of a sad story in many ways. Bonnie liked bad boys. Her prior husband was a convicted felon. Uh, there's a pretty good evidence that she was a prostitute before she in, in Dallas before she met uh, uh, Clyde Barrow. But without those, you know, but she, they both grew up in abject poverty. And, uh, you know, people think of poverty today. I mean, it's just not comparable. I mean, these uh, poor people in Texas grew up in wood shacks, no running water, they're lucky if they had gas, you know, they didn't even have, you know, there were no septic tanks. They had an outhouse out back. They maybe got six years of schooling if they were lucky. The best example is Audie Murphy, the quintessential Texan, in my opinion. Audie Murphy grew up in such desperate poverty that when he finally was able, he was rejected by the Marine Corps, rejected by the Air Force because he was too short. And here's, this is the greatest combat soldier in American history. He killed 274 Nazi troopers single-handed in three and a half years of relentless combat. And Murphy, when he went to boot camp, the other you know, recruits were, many of them were middle-class, upper-middle-class football players from college and that kind of thing. This is in 1941, 42. And uh, they, were, they hated the clothes, the boots, the food. And Audie Murphy never, they all remembered this later. He raved about his wonderful new boots and the nice clean uniform that he got to wear and the fantastic food that they all hated. His food, he'd go out hunting and kill rabbits and bring them home for the family to eat. And so it's all, uh, when I hear about poverty today, you know, don't tell me about poverty. These people grew up in abject poverty. Bonnie and Clyde, the same thing. And so, yes, it, it, it is sort of um, incomprehensible today how this couple who murdered 12 law enforcement officers and they killed some of them in cold blood uh, could be romanticized. But the fact is that they had this, um, this uh, sort of uh, romantic uh, inseparable partnership they always vowed to go down together and they did well you know first off i just want to say thank you jacqueline for opening the show for me you're welcome <laughs> uh, on a side note i grew up on uh i grew up next to fort ben in georgia and you brought up Artie murphy and one of the coolest things on fort ben in georgia is that Pretty much every building is named after Artie Murphy. I mean, Fort Benning really celebrates the man. Uh, but back to uh, Frank, you know, why, what should, why do you think people forget about him? I mean, before the highway, man, I didn't even know who he was. I knew Bonnie and Clyde. 
I knew, I know Pat Garrett, I know Ryan Earp, but you know, uh, Frank is pretty much forgotten in history. Why do you think that happened? Uh, part of it is because of the uh, his own personality. He was the 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 guy. For, the best example is uh, Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp was well known in his lifetime, just like Frank Hamer. Frank Hamer, during his lifetime, uh, and his professional career began in 1906 and ended in 1955. He was one of the most famous lawmen in the United States. And that was the same thing with Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp was a very well-known character throughout the latter part of the 19th century. But by the time of uh, the 1920s, he was pretty well forgotten. And a very capable author named Stuart Lake then wrote his biography a few years after he died. And that catapulted Wyatt Earp into superhuman historical memory. And there were multiple movies, as you know, made about Wyatt Earp, the most recent uh, Tombstone starring Kurt Russell. And so uh, the same author, Stuart Lake, wanted to do a biography about Frank Hamer. And they corresponded at length beginning in 1939 up through the early 1950s. And the biography never came out. And part of the reason was that Hamer was not a publicity hound. He didn't like to talk about himself. He left no memoirs whatsoever. This is a hard thing about writing the book about him. I had to go back and use early newspaper accounts. I had to use the Texas Ranger records. Uh, he didn't write many reports. Uh, wrote a handful of letters that survived to his wife. So it's very difficult to get information about him uh, that came from him uh, firsthand. And so that was the principal reason because he was so reticent to share these extraordinary details of his life. And today though, he deserves recognition as one of the greatest lawmen, in my opinion, the greatest lawman of the 20th century. He took part in 52 uh, gun battles. He killed 24 men in the line of duty, not including Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, he saved 15 African Americans from lynch mobs between 1907 and the 1920s, and he led the fight against lynching in Texas in the 20s, which basically put an end to lynching in Texas. Uh, at, at that time, he was a captain of the Texas Ranger Force. You you brought it up. How big was that during that time? I mean, he was. I mean, he really took a fight to the Ku Klux Klan, and people really don't know how big that that was during that time. Can you explain to the audience how big that was during that time in our history? Uh, for Hamer, he was completely fearless, so he could face gunfire without flinching but he could also face political and social and cultural consequences. He just didn't care what other people thought about him. He was very religious. He didn't go to church, but he would pray outdoors. He lived much of his early life outdoors. He once said that he built a shrine to God out in the woods somewhere where he grew up in the Texas Hill Country. And so he had this extremely strong view of black and white. And he had this affinity for African-Americans and it came from an incident when he was in his late teens, he was shot by a kind of a ruthless neighbor in this dispute. He was uh, shot full of buckshot and a black field hand saved his life, picked him up, loaded him into a wagon, took him to a doctor and Hamer uh, maintained this sort of friendship with members of the black community for the rest of his life. And it, it, he seemed to, at least in my research, it appears that he had this, uh, felt that he owed a debt to the black community. And so, and another th uh, thing that affected that was his captain, when he was a young man, was a guy named John Rogers. And Rogers was also deeply religious. He was called the praying captain. He carried a Winchester rifle and a Bible. And Rogers, and this is not something that anybody made up. You can go to the Texas State Archives and read these uh, letters by Captain Rogers where he'll write in uh, uh, 
railing against treatment of innocent blacks and innocent Latinos who've been targeted by mobs. And he calls them inoffensive Negroes and inoffensive Mexicans who are being beat up and driven out of these various towns in East Texas. And so this is Hamer's training uh, reinforced his feelings that he already had about African-Americans. And so as a result, he took all these actions, which are extremely unpopular at the time, but he just didn't care. He did what he thought was right. So you, you had mentioned earlier that with Hamer, there isn't a lot of historical data. You know, he didn't leave a lot of records. As someone who enjoys historical artifacts and going back to historical sites and stuff, when you go to research these people, you know, how, how is the process? You know, obviously you're pulling archives, you're doing, you know, the interview work that you can do. Do you go back on location to these places? I do go to locations. Uh, some of it depends on the time that I have available. I made numerous trips to Texas. One of my favorite things I tell people, uh, folks will tell me, oh, I'm researching so-and-so. And I'll say, oh, what kind of research are you doing? Well, I went on Wikipedia. And the problem is with Wikipedia, approximately 50% of everything on it about the old West is completely wrong. So it makes me wonder when I read about current events or sports, I just wonder how much of that is wrong. I will say that Wikipedia is getting better. But what I tell everybody, if you haven't had a close encounter with a rat, in the basement of a courthouse in West Texas, you're not doing your research. So yes, you have to go to these courthouses, you have to go to archives. Uh, briefly, one of the most detailed chapters in my book is about the so-called Sherman riot of 1930. Frank Hamer and four of his rangers held off a mob of 6,000 who finally burned down their own courthouse in Sherman in North Texas, killing a black prisoner whom Hamer was trying to protect. The judge had ordered the prisoner be locked up in the vault of the county clerk. And then everybody fled and Hamer and his men rushed through the courthouse trying to find the key, but everybody had fled. And finally the prisoner was burned to death uh, inside the courthouse. So to get that story, I managed to locate the martial law records that had been uh, locked away in a box in a warehouse in Austin, in an army base in Austin, Texas. And I was so fortunate that the wonderful archivist there, she knew where everything was. She rolled out the red carpet for me. Uh, she let me use her copy machine and copied hundreds of pages of testimony. And in so doing, I was able to identify the leaders of the mob uh, the men who dragged the body out of the vault after blowing it up with dynamite, dragged the body through the black neighborhood of town, uh, you know, just did horrible uh, uh, defacing of the, of the dead body. They're all named in the book. And I say so that their names can live in infamy because I want people to remember who did this kind of thing and, and why did they do it? And it's uh, this sort of idea that racism is taught. No child is born a racist. They are taught to be racist. Just the, the song from the, the musical South Pacific says it all. So you've, you've given life to this gentleman who most of us wouldn't know about or be aware of outside of you know, a reference to a Netflix show. Um, do you find that you are inspired by giving life to the underdogs of the Wild West? Uh, yes, I think so. And I think that with Frank Hamer, he certainly had negative things about his career. So if you did some of the things that he did today, an officer would be in jail. And I'll give he you does one, write one the one line. Yes. And a lot of it was self-preservation. So uh, in 1920, uh, it was just at the tail end of the Mexican Revolution. Many of Pancho Villa's men, Pancho Villa being the main Americans considered him a bandit. Uh, Mexican, uh, many Mexicans in Northern Mexico considered him a great patriot, but his forces were all rendered unemployed at the end of the revolution. So they, they became smugglers or tequileros, smuggling tequila across the line in 
uh, El Paso. And in so doing, numerous El Paso state, local, and federal lawmen, about five or six were murdered in a case in the space of uh, one or two years. So Hamer was sent to El Paso to see if he could put a stop to this killing. And he tells these uh, federal officers, these prohibition agents, because uh, this is during the prohibition period, uh, what are you fellas doing to get so many men killed down here? And they said, well, we order these guys to stop and surrender and they open fire and one of us ends up either wounded or dead. And Hamer tells them, that's not how you do it. So they set up an ambush on what was called Pirate Island back then. I think it was the term for it. There was a no man's land about a mile south of downtown El Paso where the Rio Grande had shifted. And there was an area which was disputed whether it belonged to the US or Mexico. And Mexican smugglers had built trenches in this area. And so Hamer's men set up this ambush and they see six armed tequila smugglers uh, coming along they're carrying rifles and they're carrying these big uh, barrels of tequila. And Hamer and one of the other guys was a former ranger, they're armed with semi-automatic rifles. They jump up from their position, open fire without warning and kill all six of these smugglers in a matter of seconds. And Hamer goes uh, up and he pokes the dead bodies with his boot and, th and then he says, uh, now say manos arribas to these sons of in other words, now tell them to raise their hands because they're dead. They can't fire at you. So if you if you look at that as a police action, those officers are guilty of murder because under U.S. versus Tennessee, a police officer can't shoot a fleeing felon. A police officer has to give a warning, you know, before shooting. Uh, so under that law, yes, this would be a, a murder. And today, Hamer would be in prison. Uh, if you look at it as a military uh, uh, a military event uh, in on Mexico soil against an, uh, armed incursionists against the United States, then it's absolutely justifiable. When the special forces ambush the Taliban and they see six armed Taliban approaching in a trench, they don't order the Taliban to surrender. They open fire and kill them as quickly as they can because it's a combat situation. So the reader in my book, I tell the whole story and let the reader draw his own conclusion. You bring, you bring an interesting question. Elliot Ness, Sherrod Pusser, Briar Earp, Pat Garrett. All these men allegedly, it's very important to say allegedly, are guilty of everything you just mentioned Uh probably drawing the gun way too fast. And a lot of these lawmen didn't have a happy ending at the end of their life. With that said, I was wondering, do you think their tactics were more affected then? And that's the reason why there's less crime during that time. And with that question, why do you think these lawmen, these famous lawmen like Elliot Ness, Sherp Pusser, Pat Garrett, has has such a bad ending to the life? In the 19th century, the homicide rates were way, way worse than they are today. So in California today, the annual homicide rate is about nine per hundred thousand. During the gold rush years of the 1850s, the California homicide rate was 300 per 100,000. It was just, there are no comparison. And there were similar homicide rates in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. Every scholar that studied these early communities finds homicide rates many, many times higher. So occasionally I give talks to the California Sheriff's Association and sometimes to various police chiefs groups and I tell them, you guys get all excited because you reduce the homicide rate from 11 per 100,000 to 9 per 100,000. Those are statistically totally insignificant because in the 19th century, you have homicide rates that are at least 50 per 100,000. So the homicide rates 
are the, in a peaceful community are five or six times higher, seven times higher than they are today. So the reason for this violence and this shoot first, ask questions later by the lawmen that you're talking about, especially, uh, you know, Wyatt Earp, uh, Pat Garrett, uh, Frank Hamer, is because everybody was armed and uh, they knew that any kind of furtive movement. Uh, today, a police officer, we have a case in Vallejo where a police officer responds to a, a looting uh, this past summer in California. Uh, the guy reaches for what turns out to be a hammer. The officer opens fire. And now the California Attorney General is considering whether to charge that officer with murder, which of course is completely inane because the officer doesn't have to wait till the guy pulls the whole thing out and realizes, oh my God, that's a hammer. The officer has a fraction of a second to make up his mind whether to shoot or not. And in the 19th century, a case like that would have never been prosecuted. Every juror brought in then and now brought their own life experiences into the courtroom. And uh, the best example is Oliver Wendell Holmes, the uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And he, he served as Chief Justice up till around 1930. But the one thing of his whole life that he always brought with him, and which affected him till his death, were his heavy combat experiences as a young officer in the Civil War, 70 years earlier. He never forgot those. He was wounded, almost killed in combat. And he was one of the men who always understood that uh, firearms are extremely dangerous. You have a community throughout the West where most men are carrying guns, maybe not openly, but they have one concealed. So these officers that you mentioned, Wyatt Earp, Pat Garrett, Pat Garrett is the best example. Uh, as Billy the Kid came in to the darkened bedroom where Garrett was trying to find out where the kid was inside Pete Maxwell's house in New Mexico. As soon as he heard these words, Ken S, Ken S, it's the kid asking who's there, who's there. The kid could see a figure sitting on Pete Maxwell's bed. Garrett jerked his pistol and killed him instantly. And it was the smartest decision he ever made because if he didn't kill the kid, he'd have been dead himself. Today, an officer has almost insurmountable uh, requirements. Uh, they almost want the officer to you know, politely inquire, oh, do you happen to be armed, sir? If you are, could you please keep your hands away from your weapon? No one did that back then. So the answer to the question is, it was a different environment, extremely violent. These officers were doing these things. This example that Hamer gave, there's an old police officer saying, and I sometimes mention this in some of my book events, and people go, a couple of times people got mad and they walked out of the room, but there's this old police officer saw that I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by six. Meaning, you know, I'd rather go get tried than be killed, right? And so, uh, that kind of thing is what governed Frank Hamer. That's why he opened fire and killed those six armed smugglers without ordering them to surrender because his career would have been over in 1920 as opposed to 1955 if he hadn't done that kind of thing. Uh, the second part of that question was, uh, why do you think these uh, lawmen had such a sad ending to their life? Well, you mentioned uh, uh, Pat Garrett, for example. Uh, he had an up and down political career. He was finally shot in the back and killed in a quarrel. There's a lot of disputes over uh, why that happened. Uh, with Elliot Ness, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, Elliot Ness, of course, tracked down uh, uh, some of the great uh, uh, bank robbers of you know like John Dillinger of the of the Depression era, and J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, had was one of the weirdest, most psychologically fouled up people in American history, right? At least people who were in positions of power. And Hoover was insanely jealous 
of the publicity that Elliot Ness got. So he ran him out of the bureau. It caused terrible depression. And finally, Elliot Ness, as you say, uh, committed suicide. And so I think it was personal to each of them. In Hamer's case, uh, his life was a happy one. That uh, he died, you know, of natural causes in 1955. Uh, for Hamer, the biggest tragedy of his life was his his uh, older son was killed in action on Iwo Jima in 1945. And by all accounts, he was never the same after that. He became a heavy drinker had some marital problems from what I've been able to discern. And, uh, but he, he eventually overcame that. But I think that uh, the amount of violence that these guys faced must have caused some kind of post-traumatic stress syndrome, which was not diagnosed back then. So clearly a lot of these guys did meet violent deaths. Well, in the movie Highway Man on Netflix, starring Kevin Costner and Woody Harrison. Woody Harrison plays a man named Manny Galt. Tell us a little about him. Well, Manny Galt was a neighbor of Hamer, and it's a little bit unclear how they met. He lived uh, about a about a half a mile south of Hamer's home in Austin, Texas. And uh, Hamer initially used him as sort of a part-time uh, special Texas Ranger, kind of an informant uh, to try to find uh, people. This is during the Prohibition era. So he used him to buy liquor from liquor dealers and then they'd arrest the liquor dealers. And then eventually uh, through Hamer's influence, Galt received a commission as a regular Texas Ranger and they became very close friends and Galt himself later uh, had a very successful career as a Texas Ranger. So he's sort of generally remembered today as Frank Hamer's sidekick, but he went on after the killing of Bonnie and Clyde to have his own career as a, as a Texas Ranger. So you saw the movie Highway, man. We talked about, like, I still remember Bonnie and Clyde movie with uh, Warren Beatty and Gene Hackman. Uh, I remember seeing the scene that, Frank Hamer was on the road and they was taking pictures with him. Bonnie and Clyde was taking pictures and Gene Hackman was taking, you know, holding the camera and then he spits in Bonnie's face and they put him in a boat handcuff. Now, historically, that never happened. I don't think no. Frank Hamer, Frank Hammer's never met Bonnie and Clyde till that day. Bonnie and Clyde died. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. The, the only time Hamer uh, ever came within 50 feet of Bonnie and Clyde, they were dead within about three or four seconds. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the film, the 1968 film, was heavily fictionalized. Uh, yeah, I think it did a good job of showing the relationship of Bonnie and Clyde. But the incident where they kidnap Hamer is actually uh, taken from two other incidents, one in uh, eastern New Mexico, they actually kidnapped a deputy sheriff and they held him for a couple of days before they released him. And then they did that again, I believe it was in Oklahoma where they kidnapped another officer and held him for about a day or so and then they released him. So those are sort of uh, incidents that were uh, compounded into one you know, narrative about Frank Hamer. Uh, so, of course, Hamer was never captured by any outlaw in his life. So what my qu my question is, how accurate was that Netflix movie with Kevin Costner and Willie Harrison? The Netflix movie, it's also very fictionalized. Uh, many of those incidents are uh, are, you know, sort of dramatized uh, the way that uh, Hamer uh, captured Bonnie and Clyde was by working very closely uh, with uh, other law officers. He worked closely with the local sheriff, Henderson Jordan in Louisiana. He worked for months with, an F with the uh, several FBI agents. And so the, the way that they caught Bonnie and Clyde was quite a bit different than depicted in the the movie and the interesting thing is, and this goes back to doing research on it, that 
the the narrative was unknown until 2009 or 2008 when the Bonnie and Clyde file was found in the basement of the federal courthouse in Dallas, Texas, totally by accident. And it's kind of a long story, but it was eventually released in unredacted form by the FBI. And that showed for the first time the work, the FBI agents wrote detailed reports about what Hamer was doing. Hamer didn't write reports, he didn't like them, but the FBI agents did. And so through those FBI reports, uh, it, it's very clear how Hamer, Sheriff Jordan and the FBI made contact with the Methvin family and with the, the father. So the, the way that the ambush is depicted in the 1968 film is quite accurate. Uh, it was based on hearsay and innuendo, uh, which existed for many years, that the Methvin family rolled over and gave up Bonnie and Clyde to try to save their son, Henry Methvin, from a prison term. And that's exactly what happened. The FBI, agent, the FBI reports confirm that. So the, both movies are fictionalized. They're both extraordinarily entertaining. And uh, the wonderful thing about The Highwaymen, it's written by John Fusco, who's written other great screenplays. And the great thing about it, and John Fusco has this tremendous passion for this Frank Hamer story and worked on it for many, many years. Originally, The Highwaymen, it was supposed to be uh, Robert Redford and Paul Newman. And then this was years ago, like 15 years ago. And that's how long he was trying to get the film made. So it's a great story, but yes, fictionalized. And, you know, and I, I fully understand that because you can't, I'm a historian, but you have to understand that film and TV rarely depicts facts exactly as they happen. Yeah, I, I can see that because, you know, my little girl, you know, me and her are both Billy the Kid addicts. Like, we love Billy the Kid. I got I liked him as a little boy, and I, got, I have two sons, but my, my oldest son doesn't really care about anything that I like. So my daughter likes everything I like. So I introduced her to Young Guns and Young Guns 2. And I, during the movie, I was trying to explain to her, like, this is not real. This is not real. Charlie doesn't die at the end, really. He dies later on in Young Guns 2, but Doc's going to die. You know, you see what I'm saying? Yes. And, I, and I was trying to explain more about the regulators. Uh, that's one thing I, I want to close with that this. And then Jacqueline's got some questions. That's one thing I don't like about movies is that the truth is sometimes more entertaining than fiction. And like, if you take Billy the Kid, for example, you can just tell the truth and tell the story of Lincoln, the Lincoln County War exactly the way it was and it probably win an Oscar. You know, Young Guns is a good movie. Young Guns 2 was a good movie, but it was so historically inaccurate that I don't know. I just kind of wish that one day they'll take a Billy the Kid movie and do like you should tell the whole story three hours. And I'm telling you, it'd probably be one of the best movies ever made. But with that said, my opinion doesn't matter. Jacqueline, go ahead. So you actually did a great job leading into my next question. There's a really rich history in the Wild West, and we are only privy to so much that is consumable at this time. Uh, unbeknownst to anyone who hasn't had a chance to read your book about Frank Hamer, uh, you gave away a lot of the spoilers and it's still a great story, but who would be someone else that, you know, you've captivated their imagination. They want to know more. Who's someone else that, you know, the average listener should go listen to or look into that really kind of has that same spark. Well, my forthcoming book is due. I'll give it a plug. It's due in November. It's a, a, a biography of Pearl Hart. And she's the most uh, notorious woman outlaw of the Old West. And there's never been a book written about her. It was a lot of fun to write. I managed to figure out who she was, her real name, where she came from. And it's a pretty remarkable story. So I think that that is a good example of, uh, we were talking before about how Hamer's story has been forgotten. 
in Pearl Hart's case, uh, she still remembered today, there's lots of magazine articles, every book about women in the old West usually has a chapter about her, but the information's all wrong because she didn't want people to know who she was. So she made up these kooky stories to protect her family. But that's an example of somebody who uh, I love to bring this stuff back to life. And that's a good example of it. Well, you've done an amazing job with Frank Hamer and I, I hope that people will take the time to either watch the show if you're not into books or read the book because the stories are amazing. And it's the fact that it's truth and not fiction. It, it's really, it puts you in that moment and it's a really neat opportunity for someone who didn't live in that time period or isn't as old as Joey. Um, so <laughs> with that being said, thank you so much for your time today and congratulations on all your success. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Whoa, 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 Jack, and I'll let you open. You're not going to close. <laughs> Before we let everybody go, uh, let's start with you, Jacqueline. What can we find in the book? What can we find you on social media? And tell everybody about your new OnlyFans. Uh, what, <laughs> Joey. Uh, so <laughs> since I'm laid up with a foot surgery, I'm oh, still no. writing. Uh, we're promoting Comfortably Uncomfortable. The road to happiness isn't always paved and it's all about growing pains that I'm currently going through. So you can find us on Instagram at grown up growing pains. And with that said, John, I have to admit you're the first, first ever New York time bestselling author on my show is an honor to have you. Please tell everybody where we can find you and tell everybody about the book. So the book is called uh, Texas Ranger. Uh, the Epic Life of Frank Hamer, The Man Who Killed Bonnie and Clyde. And the easiest way to get it is on Amazon. Short and to the point. No social media accounts? No no Twitter? No, I'm on Facebook. Not really. Yeah. I'm probably yeah. too old-fashioned. I'm on Facebook, but that's neither here nor there. Well, I'm going to tell you what. This is the honest God truth. I was so excited to have you on the show because I love history. I love the fact that you, you came on our show. You're part of the CTS family. And by all means, you got so much more to talk about. And I hope you one day, if you didn't get discouraged, you come back on the show and tell us more because I don't know about you, Jacqueline, but I love history. And I love what you know. And you, maybe you can educate some of the audience or what is going on in that little brain of yours. And that came out so wrong. I need to sleep. <laughs> we are excited about your perspective on Pearl because a lot of the bad girls of the Wild West don't get their story told properly. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you. Yeah. And truth be told, I've been up since Monday afternoon, about four o'clock, and I haven't been asleep yet. So today's Tuesday is already. I've been up. Over 24 hours now. So with that said. It's time to go night-night. Time to go night-night. No, I got, still got, I got another show I got to go do. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> with that said, John, uh, I, I humbly say this for the bottom of my heart. Uh, I really do appreciate you coming on. Jacqueline, you know you're always part of the CTS family. Everybody else, we got to go. John, Jacqueline, stay on the line. Everybody else, see you next Sunday.